Thank you for joining us today for our seventh Bible study in the life of Joseph. The overall uh, theme of these studies is uh, summed up in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, which says, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. We're looking at the providence of God, that through bad things God can bring good, that in all God, in all God works for good for those who love him. God's providence is not saying that bad things like this coronavirus are sent by God, but it's saying that God can use all things for good and for his glory by his providence. We're going to be reading today Genesis chapter 42. So please turn to that in your Bible. It's quite a long chapter but we do need to take it as a whole chapter because it's uh, one complete episode in itself. So please bear with me as we read Genesis chapter four, 42, as we take in this section of God's word. Let's pray as we come to read God's word together. Please pray with me. Father God, we thank you for your word, which reveals your living truth. We thank you for the Bible the source of inspiration and hope in our times of need. We thank you for your Bible, which contains all that we need to know of the revelation of our living God. And we pray as we read this chapter together now and think about it carefully, that you may speak to us, that you may encourage us, that you may bless us, and that you may lead us closer to Christ and to be more like Jesus day by day. Amen. So I'm going to read to you Genesis chapter 42. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you keep looking at each other? He continued, I've heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Then ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob didn't send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others, because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain, for there was famine in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brother arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognised them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from? he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognised his brothers, they did not recognise him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. No, my lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said to them. You've come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, Your servants were twelve brothers, the sons of one man, who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, and one is no more. Joseph said to them, It is just as I told you, you are spies, and this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of your number to get your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison, so that your words may be tested to see if you are telling the truth. If you are not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. And he put them all in custody for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison, while the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me so that your words may be verified, and that you may not die. This they proceeded to do. 
They said to one another, Surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded for us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come on us. Reuben replied, Didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. They didn't realise that Joseph could understand them, since he was using an interpreter. He turned away from them and began to weep, but then came back and spoke to them again. He had Simeon taken from them and bound before their eyes. Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain, to put each man's silver back in his sack, and to give them provisions for their journey. After this was done for them, they loaded their grain on their donkeys and left. At the place where they stopped for the night, one of them opened his sack to get feed for his donkey, and he saw his silver in the mouth of his sack. My silver has been returned, he said to his brothers. Here it is in my sack. Their hearts sank and they turned to each other trembling and said, What is this that God has done for us? When they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them. They said, The man who is lord over the land spoke harshly to us and treated us as though we were spying on the land. But we said to him, We are honest men, we are not spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of one father. One is no more, and the youngest is now with our father in Canaan. Then the man who is lord over the land said to us, This is how I will know whether you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me and take food for your starving households and go. But bring your youngest brother to me, so I will know that you are not spies but honest men. Then I will give your brother back to you, and you can trade in the land. As they were emptying their sacks, there in each man's sack was his pouch of silver. When they and their father saw the money pouches, they were frightened. Their father Jacob said to them, You've deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and now you want to take Benjamin. Everything is against me. Then Reuben said to his father, You may put both of my sons to death, if I do not bring him back to you. Entrust him to my care, and I will bring him back. But Jacob said, My son will not go down there with you. His brother is dead and he is the only one left. If harm comes to him on the journey you are taking, you will bring my grey head down to the grave in sorrow. This is God's word to us today. So that's the chapter we're looking at today, Genesis chapter 42, if you're just joining us. Welcome, I'm Wayne Clark from Trinity Baptist Church in Gorton, and this is the seventh of our Bible studies in the life of Joseph. Last time we saw Joseph entering into his new role of vizier of Egypt and taking control of the food supply. He gathered food from the people in the good years and sold it back to them in the famine years, which made Pharaoh rich, but also saved the people from starvation. And people came to Joseph's stores from all over Egypt. Getting grain was like finding toilet rolls in Sainsbury's. But soon people started coming from all over that region of the world. Now, back in Canaan, as the song goes, the future looked rough. Jacob's family were finding it tough. So the family of Jacob went down to Egypt. What they didn't know is that the people of the Hebrews, the people who took their name from Jacob, otherwise known of Israel, would be resident in Egypt from this day onwards for the next more than 200 years until they left at the Exodus. This was the beginning of a new chapter in the life of the Hebrew people. 
right through until the time Moses led those people out of slavery. Jacob sends the ten brothers to Egypt, holding on to Benjamin, the last remaining son of Rachel and full brother of Joseph. The brothers have kept up that deception about Joseph all these years, and Jacob's special attachment to Benjamin is a sign of, well, that he's still in grief. Still in grief for his wife, Rachel, and still in grief, certainly, for his son, Joseph. Benjamin is the only thing he has left to remind him of his favourite wife and his other favourite son. So the brothers go to Egypt. Verse 6 tells us that the brothers appeared before Joseph and bowed down their faces to the ground before the vizier of Egypt, whom they didn't recognise as their own brother, Joseph. Joseph was speaking Egyptian, was fully assimilated into the culture by now, would have looked every inch a high-ranking Egyptian leader, probably wearing makeup on his face. The Egyptian uh, paintings that we have from this era show that they made up their faces and uh, disguised, as it were, their appearance. This is why the brothers wouldn't have recognised him, apart from the fact that they would have had no idea that Joseph could be such a person. Now, the dreams Joseph had all those years ago about corn bowing, ba bowing down to him and stars bowing down to him that represented the brothers were fulfilled as the brothers bowed low before Joseph. His older brothers were all here, prostrating themselves before their younger brother. The actions Joseph takes here could be seen as vengeful. He said, you must be spies. You've come to spy out the land on behalf of your land. Perhaps a little bit of it could be seen as rubbing their noses in it for what they did to him. But uh, there's more to it than that. It's a complex and psychologically complicated uh, reaction that Joseph has here. He's obviously distressed, but he's also full of love and compassion. If Joseph is teaching them a lesson, it's a lesson that comes from real affection and brotherly love. Verse 24 is very touching. Did you notice that in verse 24, the way Joseph reacts to hearing, overhearing the brother's conversation. Of course, they don't know that he understands their language. So when he speaks, uh, when he hears them speak uh, about um, their regret, well, their regret at the consequences, at least, of their actions, it says he turned away from them and began to weep. What was that weeping about? Weeping for himself, weeping for the lost years, weeping that he himself had broken relationships with his brothers because of what had happened. Weeping for what had become of them over the years. And Joseph does show the brothers generosity. Joseph has a plan, a cunning plan to get the family back together. He wants to see Benjamin and he wants to see his father. Joseph has been shown to be good with plans and his plans usually succeed. He is a man of wisdom and judgment. So he has a plan here that is wise and well judged. So he accuses them of being spies, but he does that as a way of getting them to go back and get their brother. The first plan is for just one man to return to Canaan. But then he says, no, um, all of you can return except one. Just one of you can stay, stay here. And then he acts generously in two ways. First of all, he allows them to have grain to take back to their family. He, he has concern for the, uh, the brothers and their family left in Canaan. And then also uh, he gives them silver, their silver that they were to pay for the grain. He gives it to them back. 
The brother who is chosen to stay behind is Simeon. Simeon is brother number two, the second oldest. Uh, the next oldest after Reuben, the leader of the pack. Who we see, see in this chapter as still being the leading brother. Uh, Simeon is the next oldest and that's why Simeon is chosen. And Joseph does this not just uh, out of self-interest, but he says he does it uh, because of his fear of God. Verse 18 is interesting. Verse 18, uh, Joseph says, uh, do this, in other words, fit in with my plan, uh, and you will live for I fear God. He's saying that they can trust his honesty as a God-fearing man. That is a strange thing for an Egyptian, a high-ranking Egyptian official to say. He uses the name of God that would have been familiar to these Hebrews, not the name of God, not a, an Egyptian God. The Egyptians had many gods, but uh, as it's recorded here in the scriptures, he uses the name of the, the God of the Hebrews. The brothers don't seem to pick up on that, but as we read it, we see in Joseph's heart there is still that knowledge of God who is with him. So Joseph packs up the bag of food and hides in them the payment for the food. Why do you think Joseph gave them their money back? Was it a generous gesture? I don't want your money, I want this as a gift. Or was it as a way of testing them and frightening them? When they found the money, it, it seemed to strike fear into them because they think, think they'll be seen as thieves. There's more of that in the next chapter with the incident with the silver cup. We'll see about that. But I would like, I'd like to think he was being kind, though it did sort of backfire on the family. Now they have the money as well. Uh, perhaps they fear that the grand man, as they see him back in Egypt, will think they are getting away with theft. And that sense of guilt starts in Egypt in verse 21 we are punished being because of our being punished because of our brother it says in verse 21 it's there on the journey in verse 28 what is it that God has done to us and that's not a good thing that seems to be God has brought punishment on us because of our evil and then it comes to a head as they arrive home Jacob is frantic I've lost Joseph and I've lost Simeon and now I'm going to lose Benjamin as well this chapter ends with Jacob determined that Benjamin will not go to Egypt. And then like all the best stories, like the soap operas each, uh, each episode, it leaves you on a cliffhanger. What's going to happen next? Duff, 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 duff. Will Jacob allow Benjamin to go? And how have they forgotten so quickly about Simeon in a, a prison cell in Egypt? Is he in that dungeon that Joseph had to stay in for a few years. Well, find out in the next exciting chapter of Joseph in Egypt. That's how our story ends for today. We'll find more out about that when we resume this account on Tuesday. Of course, you can read ahead and uh, probably most of us know the end of the story anyway. But let's pause there and say this is not just a good story. It is a good, it's a cracking good story. And that's why musicals and, and plays and films have been made out of it. But let's stop and say this is God's word. And it's God's word for eternity, but it's also God's word for today for us. How is God speaking to you through this passage? What is it that God's saying here? There's lots of interesting, fascinating psychology going on in here. And also some interesting considerations about revenge and forgiveness. What is God saying to you today through this passage? Hi to everyone who's watching. Hello to Elaine. Haven't mentioned you before. Rustam, hello. Good to have you with us. Bless you, all of you who are watching, as well as those who are watching on YouTube, uh, who have caught up with this on our YouTube channel. Good to have you with us. So what strikes me here in this passage, first of all, is the 
Well, things that come out of the complexity of the character of Joseph. Joseph is at work. Again, God intervening in his working life. Joseph is busy at work, this time selling grain to foreigners for Pharaoh, and his brothers turn up. All those memories flood back. And as they bow before him, all the more so. Yes, these boys, now mature men, look at them, getting on in years. <laughs> look, there's Reuben, there's Issachar, there's Zebulun. Look at them now. These men, these are the ones who hurt me, jo Joseph would have thought. These are the ones who rejected me. These are the ones who nearly killed me. It's because of them that I ended up in prison. But it's because of them that I ended up where I am now. Joseph is a man now and in command. And he handles this highly charged encounter with caution and with dignity. He knows that his God, his father's God, is still in control. He knows God has brought him to this moment of denouement, this moment of bringing a, a swift end to this story. But he doesn't bring a swift end to it. He prolongs the agony. He actually takes a risk in sending the ten brothers away. He may never see them again. He may never see again his beloved Benjamin or his father Jacob, who he knows is still alive. He, he, at least he's discovered that. Jacob may well have passed away of old age by now, but Jacob's still alive, Benjamin's still alive. He's, he's discovered those tidbits of information, and he desperately wants to see them again. It seems to me that Joseph still has confidence that God is in control. He still have confidence, he grows in confidence that God's providential control over this situation is still caring for him, is still with him and holding him in his arms. His dreams have been fulfilled by God. God's controlling this current crisis and the confirmation that those dreams he had as a young lad uh, have now been fulfilled, confirms to Joseph that the God of his adult years is the same God who was with him in his childhood years. And the faith he learned at the, uh, at the knees of his father and mother is the faith that he must still pursue. And God will see him through. It's good to have that confidence, isn't it? That our God who was with us in our childhood, if you knew Christ as a child, then count yourself privileged. Because that God who was with you as a child is God with you now. I I didn't grow up in a Christian household, but I grew up hearing about Christ and then coming to faith in Christ gradually through the years and making a commitment to Christ when I was just 12 years and a couple of months old. And I knew that God was with me through those years. I remember praying most earnestly when I was about 11 years old. I think that was my first real prayer time personally when I was about 11 years old I remember that and then I remember making a, a lifelong commitment to Christ when I was 12 and I know that the God who I still follow the Christ who is still with me is the one who was with me in my youth and I remember those years and Joseph must similarly have remembered those years Thank you, Doreen, for your comment. Joseph wept, which is another reflection of how Joseph is like Jesus. Jesus also wept over those who had not followed the ways of his father. The second issue of character for me that comes out of this scripture is about forgiveness. Joseph's dream came to fulfilment as the brothers bowed down before him, and it reminded him of the way they had treated him. He then and there had a decision to make. Had he forgiven them? Was that all in the past? Or was it something to be dredged out of the past and brought back into the present day? Was he going to gloat and seek to punish them? Or was he going to take the forgiveness he had already offered and use it to seek reconciliation? 
To be honest, what we see of Joseph in this chapter is ambiguous. It gets a bit clearer as the chapters go on. But in this chapter, we see him accusing them of spying. Was that really? Was did he really think they were spies? No, he clearly didn't because he knew who they were. Uh, it was a bit of an act. But he sends them off with grain and with silver, perhaps to frighten them as well as to reward them. It's it's unclear, isn't it? Really, what's going on in Joseph's mind here? But he keeps Simeon in prison, but also he weeps. Clearly, what he does want is to see his brother Benjamin and then later on his father Jacob again. What I'm interested in, though, is how we apply this situation to our lives, because sometimes things happen to us that remind us of past hurts. We see things that make us remember that make us remember all of a sudden someone who hurt us or a painful time we've gone through. Have you had that happen to you where things that you see or hear or read or just remember will trigger for you a memory or, and sometimes it's not a good memory. It's a bad memory. It's a memory of a a past hurt or a past sin. And in those times we need to say, Lord, that's in the past. Lord, that's done and dealt with. It's gone. You've forgiven me for that. And I've released forgiveness for the hurt I've felt. I've forgiven and I've been forgiven. We need to remind ourselves to forget. Is that a bizarre thing to say? I think it's true. We need to remind ourselves to forget as well as to forgive. Two scriptures from the New Testament uh, spring into my mind at this point. One is Ephesians 4.32, which says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. As we have been forgiven, so we should forgive, but also be kind and compassionate, forgiving one another, forgetting the hurts of the past. And being actively kind and compassionate. What does that verse say to you today about times like the one Joseph was in? Not holding on to past hurts or let, or letting the past invade the peace that we have now. Not sure Joseph did that, but it's something we can choose to do. And one more verse, Romans chapter 12, verses 18 and 19 says... If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Don't take revenge, my dear friends, Paul says, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Vengeance is mine, as it says in the old authorised version. That's Romans 12, verses 18 and 19. How does that verse speak to you about letting this past stay in the past? Let go of any idea of revenge. I want to say that to Joseph today. Joseph, don't don't take, don't, don't, just don't try to take revenge. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. It is mine to avenge, says the Lord. Live at peace. Let the past stay in the past. Remember to forget. Or as another saying goes, let go and let God. Have you got other thoughts that stem from this passage today? Other ways we can pray for one another? Doreen has put a helpful comment in here about security. She says we must have the same security in God in these days. These are days of insecurity. And Doreen says that we need to have the same security in God that Joseph had. Thank you. Yeah, that's helpful. We need to be drawing strength from our Lord Jesus in these days. These days of self-isolating, of of lack of social contact, of uh, lack of physical contact with people. We're missing the hugs that we shared with one we share with one another as a church or with a with our extended family. 
We're missing out on those connections. It, this is not a time for dwelling on the past. This is not a time for taking too long to consider the hurts of the past, but a time to forgive and to forget and to trust in our God. I'm not sure Joseph quite got to that point in our story, but considering our story today, it's something we can extrapolate, something we can read out of this passage to say, Lord, help me to be not exactly like Joseph, but to be like Jesus, because Jesus went far above and beyond what Joseph did. As Jesus, Jesus hung on the cross, he said, Lord, forgive. Lord, forgive. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Father, they've brought me to this point. Joseph looked at his brothers before him, but Jesus looked at all those around him as he hung on the cross and said, Father, forgive. Let's turn these thoughts to prayer, shall we? Just one more thought is the thought that I've been bringing every one of these studies, remembering our themes of the study. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. You intended to harm me, Joseph said at the end of this story, but God intended it for good. Let's turn these thoughts to prayers now. Let's pray for ourselves, first of all, uh, for thoughts arising from this scripture. And then let's pray for those in need. Please join me in prayers and I'll leave some time at the end for our own personal prayers. Either spoken out loud, you can speak your prayers out loud or you can pray them silently. Lord, we pray. Father God, we pray today for... Uh, thoughts that have arisen out of this scripture, things that we read here in Genesis chapter 42, which remind us of the need that we have to forgive others. Lord, we want to be like Joseph. We want to be more like Jesus in forgiving others. Help us, Lord, where those moments come that Remind us of the past, either past hurts, that are things that have hurt us, or past hurts where we have hurt others, where we have sinned against you. Lord, help us to remember to forget. Help us to remember to put in the past and to keep in the past those things that belong in the past. Help us to remember, Lord, that you are the God who forgives and forgets, and not to dredge out of the past those things that you have sent to the bottom of the sea. Lord, heal our minds and our memories and our, our spirits and our hearts. Remind us, Lord, that all these things that have happened in the past, you can use for our good by your providence. Thank you, Lord. We pray, Lord, for any today who are nursing grievances and hurts. And we pray for any today who are seeking your forgiveness. Lord, we release that forgiveness in the name of Christ. Lord, hear us. We pray today that you may help us to know the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ closer to us than ever in these times of shielding and self-isolation and social distancing. All these things that we couldn't have believed possible just a few months ago and now are our daily reality. Lord, help us at these times to know your closeness. Lord, we pray for our world, our nation, our city and our church. We pray, Lord, for those in need. We pray, Lord, as the numbers of those who have died from coronavirus or symptoms associated with coronavirus, as those numbers keep on increasing. Lord, we're so aware of the numbers in this country who are bereaved and hurting and feel lost. We see we're starting to feel that in much more personal ways, Lord, as we know we're starting to feel that we know people now who have lost friends, who have lost relatives, who have lost parents, 
who have lost individuals that they have heard of or know. And Lord, we pray for those who are bereaved. We pray for those who are hurting, who have lost loved ones. Lord, be with them. And we continue to pray, Lord, for those who are working in the health service and related services, those who are working to provide equipment for health, for the health professionals and for our hospitals, for those who are setting up new hospitals, and particularly for medics working with patients or supporting the work with patients. We pray for those in those who are doctors, those who are nurses, those who are um, medical professionals. We pray for hospital chaplains who are caring in need and in, in danger and bereaved relatives. We pray, Lord, for the work of those who are caring for the sick. We pray, Lord, for school teachers and classroom assistants and teaching assistants and uh, those who are working in our education systems to keep schools going as much as they are, for those who are affected by school closures, including parents of children, children who are ha uh, have free school meals normally and now are not ha don't have access to those uh, those meal tickets that uh, have been for many uh, the, the way in which children have uh, have been able to have a a good square meal each day. Lord, we pray that that system of tickets of vouchers for food that's going out to parents will get to the people who need them so that we do not have many, many more families in poverty in our country. Or we pray for our police service who are having new demands made on them day by day. Lord, we pray for each of those who are having to take on new challenges because of coronavirus. We continue to pray for our government. Lord, give them wisdom and strength. Lord, we pray for those in our neighbourhood, our neighbours and friends and family. And we pray that communities will be strengthened, that relationships between neighbours will be uh, better than they've ever been, and that we will be offering lifelines of support. Lord, we pray for churches as we approach Easter, that this Easter will be a time of opportunity of sharing the good news of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. As we enter into this, uh, what some Christians call Holy Week, of um, sharing the, uh, the, the story of the, uh, the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus, and then of his glorious resurrection on Easter Sunday, that the opportunities of sharing the truth of our Lord Jesus will be taken up by churches and received gladly by those who are looking for, for hope in this time of hopelessness and need. Lord, give those of us who are involved in church the opportunity to do this. May your will and your kingdom come in this place. We pray for those who are unwell who are known to us, praying for Judith, praying for Deborah's mum, praying for others who are poorly. Lord, bring your healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear us. Leave a moment of quiet for our own prayers. If you want to put some prayers into the comments, if you're watching on Facebook Live or on YouTube, then please do that. Lord, hear our prayers that we offer now in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. <laughs> 